Hello, I thought that maybe you would like to know the answers to questions about alopecia areata that I receive most commonly at conferences and on other occasions. I picked 10 questions for today. Question number one, what are the risk factors of developing alopecia areata? Well, there's only one risk factor which is really important. This is the alopecia areata in the family, especially if we have a parent or even two parents with alopecia areata, we are more likely to develop it. The other factors are less important, but also patients with the so-called atopic diseases, including atopic dermatitis and asthma, are more likely to develop alopecia areata than the general population. And then with the lower importance comes psoriasis, vitiligo, and systemic autoimmune diseases. Other factors have a less proven role in the development of alopecia areata, such as some drugs and smoking, which has been indicated as a possible risk factor. Next question, are we able to prevent alopecia areata? Well, the answer for today is no, we are not able to predict who will develop alopecia areata and we are not able to prevent it. Maybe on the positive side is that now we have tools for a very early diagnosis, what improves the efficacy of the treatment. The next question is, can alopecia areata lead to permanent hair loss? Well, the answer is yes, because the longer the disease with no hair regrowth, the lower the probability of regrowth and response to therapy. However, there are some exceptions and we have seen recently regrowth in a patient who had no hair regrowth for 40 years, so everything is possible. However, as a rule, the earlier the treatment, the higher the probability of regrowth. Next question, which disease looks clinically like alopecia areata? Well, there are many of them. I will mention just few. Of course, the first one will be pseudopelade. Pseudopelade in French means looks like alopecia areata, but it's not. It's a cicatricial form of alopecia. A second disease is classic lichen planar pilaris. It may also sometimes look like alopecia areata, but also trichotillomania, a disease sometimes really very difficult to differentiate from alopecia areata, pressure alopecia, tinea capitis, syphilitic alopecia. Hair loss in lupus may have the form of a focal alopecia looking like alopecia areata, and also metastasis of malignant tumors to the scalp may sometimes look like alopecia areata, and there are many, many other diseases, including some genetic diseases in children, which may really look very alike. So we are happy that we currently have trichoscopy, which allows easy differential diagnosis, and only in rare cases, we need to take a biopsy for histology. Next question. The question is, are there any diets that could help manage alopecia areata? Well, the answer is no. There are no general diet recommendations for patients with alopecia areata. There are some studies which may indicate that maybe some diets may modify the course of the disease, but this was never proven in large number of patients. So basically, there is no specific diet, but it is always important to have a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle. It is always beneficial for every disease, especially for an autoimmune disease like alopecia areata. Next question. Are there any topical medications that can promote hair regrowth and alopecia areata? The answer is yes, especially glucocorticosteroids are used in the topical form in mild cases of alopecia areata, and this is especially the case in children, and we tend to use glucocorticosteroids in patients who have one patch or two patches or even three patches, but there is no very active hair loss. In such cases, the topical treatment will be the first treatment of choice. Few words about the topical immunotherapy with contact allergens. It is still available in some dermatological centers and it may be effective in some patients. It is also a treatment which is off-label. 
and regarding calcellin inhibitors, pimecrolimus and tacrolimus, they are basically not effective in alopecia areata. There are some case reports about some efficacy. However, as a general rule, calcellin inhibitors are not recommended in patients with alopecia areata. Next question. How long should treatment be continued before we consider it ineffective? Of course, in patients who have no or no significant hair regrowth. Well, in general, uh, up to recently, we were saying that these are six months. And after six months, we were either changing the treatment or we were increasing the dose or we were adding another treatment, another medication to increase the efficacy. Now with JAK inhibitors, it looks a little bit different because JAK inhibitors, they have a mechanism of action which causes them to work quite slow. The onset of regrowth is usually after approximately three to four months. So in JAK inhibitors, especially with ritalzitinib, it is said that we consider it ineffective when there's no regrowth after nine months, or to be more precise, after 36 weeks. Next question, can hair regrow with no treatment? Well, my answer to this question is no, or at least the probability is very low. In some cases of mild forms of alopecia areata, when there is one patch or two patches, sometimes there is spontaneous regrowth. However, in most cases, the hair regrows in some areas and their patches develop in other areas. And this goes on for many years with uh, hair loss being in different locations on the scalp and also in different locations of the body. In cases of severe alopecia areata, especially in alopecia totalis, when there, where there is complete loss of scalp hair, the probability of a hair regrowth that is clinically significant is extremely low. And it was recently investigated in many clinical trials, which have shown that in the placebo controlled group, this is still a little bit more than spontaneous, but in the placebo controlled group, the regrowth rate was less than 10% on average. And in some clinical trials, it was even closer to 0%. So the probability of hair regrowth, especially in severe forms of alopecia areata, is extremely low. Next question. Is there a risk of recurrence after successful treatment of alopecia areata? Well, yes, unfortunately, yes. And this is why we need to treat alopecia areata for a long time. And it is a mistake, which was done by some of my patients, to discontinue treatment the moment the hair regrew. No, alopecia areata is a chronic autoimmune disease. We need to really make a switch in the immune system for it to stop attacking the hair follicles. So when discussing how long the treatment should take, some experts say three years, some say five years, some say seven years, and some of the experts say even longer. So definitely alopecia areata needs a long treatment, a long maintenance treatment in order to avoid a relapse. Next question is, are there any ongoing clinical trials focused on alopecia areata? Well, the answer is yes, yes, yes. And this makes me really happy because patients with alopecia areata have been waiting for new treatments for all of my dermatological life and significantly longer. There are now two new drugs, one approved in 2022, it's baricitinib, one approved in 2020. 23. This is ritalcitinib, and uh, one is likely to be approved in the next future. This is a JAK inhibitor, and there are new JAK inhibitors that are being investigated for alopecia areata that hopefully will come on the market in the upcoming 10 uh, or more years. There are also studies ongoing with biological drugs, uh, which are very well known in dermatology, but not yet in alopecia areata. There are new ideas and new clinical trials, and hopefully patients with alopecia areata who do not respond to the current therapies will have many more options in the upcoming years. Thanks a lot. If you have more questions about alopecia areata, please let me know. If you found this useful, please give me a like. Thanks a lot.